Accounting equation using Excel deposit form. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to learn the accounting foundation, the accounting equation with Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in Excel. If you don't have access to this workbook, that's okay because we basically built this from a blank worksheet but started in a prior presentation. So if you want to build this entire worksheet from a blank sheet, you may want to begin back there or you could just build your own sheet as we go from here or possibly just follow along with good old paper and pencil. If you do have access to this workbook though, there's three tabs down below. Example, practice blank, example, in essence, answer key, the practice tab having pre-formatted cells so you can practice the practice problem with less Excel formatting. The blank tab is where we started with a blank worksheet but basically are using a template at this point in time, adding to the template as needed as we go through the practice problems. Let's go to the example tab to get an idea of what we will be doing this time looking at transactions related to a deposit form. A deposit form being the form that is used to increase the checking account typically. So again, we got to differentiate ourselves from transactional ideas that you might see say in a textbook to tell you what is happening in as few words as possible versus what might be done in accounting software versus normal day-to-day -day type of language. So if you're talking about a textbook, remember that you're usually going to be dealing with just cash as the account that's going to be going up as opposed to a checking account and thinking deeply about the issue of bank reconciliations as we deposit something into cash, something that we want to keep in mind because it's a practical problem in real life. As we hit the checking account, we want to be able to do that in the same format as is done when the bank hits our checking account so that we can reconcile or possibly use our bank feeds more efficiently. Now, the other thing that's going to be an issue is that when we enter information into accounting software, we're going to use what we call the forms, the deposit form being the form used to increase a checking account or cash type of accounts. Typically, however, when we use deposit form in normal parlance, in normal language, we kind of imagine that we're going to the bank, filling out a deposit form, and then making a physical deposit, which many people might say, I don't do that because I'm online now. I don't make physical deposits. Deposits forms are old news. I don't deal with that stuff anymore. But in the accounting software, the deposit form means the data input form that we record in order to increase a, a checking account. And you might say even that is outdated because I use electronic transfers to make the deposits. But still, even if you do it electronically automating the system, the system will typically name the form that's going to be generated automatically a deposit form. So we want to basically keep that in mind. So we're talking here about multiple levels in terms of the language of deposit form. What does it mean like when I actually make a deposit to the bank versus what does it mean in terms of a data input form when I put it into a software such as uh, a QuickBooks and from a textbook standpoint, what does it mean when they're trying to tell me that I need to increase the checking account? What is the book's language for telling me that? Which is going to be different, of course, than kind of the real life situation. It's trying to approximate that. All right. So we're going to keep those in mind. Remembering that increases to the checking account. When does that happen? Hopefully, 
and some process in our revenue cycle is going to be the normal de deposits that are going to be going into our checking account because increases in cash hopefully are coming from some types of sales that have happened. However, we could also have deposits from other sources such as the owners, us, say the owner puts money in in a sole proprietor or if it was a corporation, the issuance of stocks from the corporation would be the similar way of, of getting money from the owners. Or you might take out a loan from the bank, for example, getting money into the checking account, not from customers, but from a loan. So that means that the deposit form is a form that we can't really automate as easily possibly as decreases to the checking account when you think about things like bank feeds, for example, because we have the issue of possible use of a deposit form for multiple things and we often have this accrual issue that comes into play because if my accounting system deals with me having to invoice clients and then receive payment, I need to tie the deposit form to the invoices. That becomes an issue as does inventory because when I record some transactions, I might have be dealing with inventory. All right, keeping those things in mind, let's go to the blank tab. We're starting out with just our normal 50,000 in the books, cash at 20,000, inventory at the 30,000 on the assets for the 50,000, the other side in equity for the initial investment. So now we're going to go say it's going to be 315 and we're going to say that we're making a sale on account, sale on account. Now, so that's going to be my starting point. Now, remember from a book standpoint, when I make a sale on account, then that's what a book might mean to say I sold something, but I didn't get cash at the time. Instead, I got an IOU, accounts receivable going up. In terms of forms, the form, as we saw earlier, would be an invoice type of form, typically. Remember, in the invoice form from a data input standpoint, being different than uh, like an invoice paper form, right? The, the language of data input being more specific than even normal accounting language like an accounting office, where you might call it billing the client, for example. All right, so we're gonna say accounts receivable is gonna go up. I'm gonna do this fairly fast because we've done it before. We've seen this, we've been there, we've done that. And then we're gonna go back on over to the sales. Revenue is gonna be going up. So I'm gonna say equals and say, there that is. I'm gonna enter my zeros across the board. Zero tab, zero tab, tab, zero tab zeros across the board the board has zeros across it as of now i'm going to go into my ar sub ledger here's my ar sub ledger i'm going to imagine this was customer a just generic customer a breaking out the receivable in the sub ledger by who owes us the money 1600 again running balance is going to equal what we had before plus the sum of the current activity between only two customers a and b therefore our sub ledger here tying into the general ledger of accounts receivable breaking out who owes us the money in this case customer a all right let's go back on over and let's put the balance here i'm going to do the balance summing it up equals the sum and sum it up little darling sum it up little all right we're gonna right click paste it formulas only so we don't mess up the beautiful color scheme that is helping us to understand the whole system in a way that is just amazingly efficient and so we'll just paste it formulas here okay so then we'll copy this down i'm going to copy this down so our accounting equation assets went up by 1600 to 51.6 total assets because the receivable went up nothing happened to the liabilities copying this down on the equity side we had an increase of 1600 to equity even though we didn't get cash because we're on an accrual basis driven by the fact that we had to do the work first i'm going to underline here and then get the money later that's the industry that we happen to be in that's just the way it is man that's just the way it is you know what i mean all right, so now we're going to go to um, receive payment. Now, this is when the deposit form uh, happens, when we have the receive payment. So now we're going to say that on 
three, let's say 20, we receive payment, receive payment on account. So when I say receive payment on account, that's what a textbook might say to say, I got money, not for work we did at the same time, we got the money, but we did the work before, therefore, instead of recording revenue at the point in time we got the money, right now, we're gonna be decreasing the accounts receivable instead from a data input form perspective in accounting software, you might have a receive payment form, but that receipt, this is where it gets a little messy in the accounting software, right? Because if you're saying a deposit is usually the form that we think of using in a data input form to increase the checking account. And here we might have another form for many accounting softwares that use a receive payment form because they want to use a form that is going to be tied specifically to the accounts receivable. That's typically a receive payment form. Now you can use that form in accounting software in a similar way as a deposit and get that money depositing it directly into the checking account. But sometimes you can't really do that because you might be receiving payments that are going to be grouped together, such as if you're, if you're receiving payments from like a credit card or something, you're not going to get it going directly into your checking account at, in this case, 1,600, but rather grouped with other received payments through the credit card by the credit card company. Then it's going to hit your bank account in some kind of lump sum. Therefore, you might put it into undeposited funds or some type of clearing account so that you can then move it from there into the checking account using a deposit form in that case uh, in the same grouping that will be found on the bank statements allowing you to do a bank reconciliation more easily so first let's let's this time put it directly into the to checking account this would be something you can do in practice if for example you're getting electronic transfers for example and they just wire the money directly to you using like i don't know a paypal or some kind of electronic transfer that you might have set up through the accounting software given the fact that i'm not grouping it such as i would have to do in a credit card i might just deposit it directly into the checking account using the receive payment form which in this case is kind of equivalent to a deposit form except that it has the special characteristic that it's always going to be decreasing the accounts receivable so we're going to say the other side is going to be a decrease to the ar let's put our zeros across the board zero 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 okay that's tedious i know and then in our sub ledger we got paid now so in column a for customer a i'm now going to put negative of this 1600 remembering that we're doing this manually here in excel in accounting software the sub ledger will typically be done for you if you set up the software properly and enter the proper form of a receive payment which can then be matched to the invoice automatically creating the decrease to the sub ledger applying that decrease to the proper customer all right so i'm going to say this is going to be this one minus the sum of this run running balance back down to oh wait a second equals this one plus the sum because this is a negative number all right there we go back down to zero all right let's put the balance down here balance summing it up here we go summing up the last two transactions from the last balance to the current activity and enter we will copy that and paste it on down formulas only paste it on down formulas only paste it on down formulas only and then we'll copy it down to make sure that we are still in balance copying this down to give me the transaction and the, so nothing happened here why what do you mean nothing happened i got cash yeah but the other side was accounts receivable which is already an asset we didn't hit the equity because we hit the equity before when we actually uh did the work so let's copy this down boom boom copy this down boom boom uh, no impact across the board even though there was a transaction because both sides were in the asset side of things all right let's do another one similar process but this time we're going to take it through undeposited uh funds here first 
So let's say this happened on 415, let's say 415. And I'm just gonna say, once again, we had a sale on account. In other words, we issued an invoice for work that we did that we're not gonna get paid for yet, but we're gonna collect in the future. Let's call that 1,400. The invoice form being the form that will record the transaction that increased the asset of the IOU, accounts receivable, accounts receivable, and then it's not really an IOU, it's a they owe us. They owe us because we're the ones that they owe the money. To. Anyway, sales is going to go up then over here. So we're going to say the sales is going to be equal to the 1,400. And then we'll put that once again into our sub ledger. Let's say it was customer B this time, just to see how the sub ledger works. We have a separate customer breaking out who owes us the money, not by date when the transaction happened, but by customer. So the running balance, it was at zero plus the sum of these two, close it up back to now it's at 1400 that 1400 of course matches what's in our gl account or our accounts receivable let's put the zeros across the board to fit to fill this thing out so we don't get confused with blank spaces across our worksheet that gets confusing and we don't like i don't like being confused i try to work every i diligently work not to be confused so i don't want those stupid blank spaces Let's sum it up again. This is going to be equal to the sum of the prior balance and the current activity. Copying this, paste it across the board, pasting it with the formulas only, pasting it with the formulas only, pasting it with the formulas only. And boom. All right, let's go back on back on over. That's what we have now. All right. So, so now we're going to say that we receive the payment which is once again, kind of where we use that receive payment form as like a deposit form. But this time we're not gonna put it into the checking account directly, but rather into a clearing account like undeposited funds an activity you don't typically see in accounting software. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in accounting textbooks because they kind of make it generic and don't really deal with the issue of having to reconcile the bank account and needing to make sure that your deposits are properly formatted to make that as easy as possible. But when you get into practice, it's important. People run into problems all the time. So I'm gonna say that this is gonna be uh, 1,400, let's just say uh, receive payment, 1,400. So now we're gonna say, instead of putting it into the checking account, cash is affected, I'm putting it into the clearing account taking that one added step, which would be important if it was paid by like a credit card and I needed to match it with other payments before the credit card issued the money into my checking account. Similarly with cash, you have a similar type uh, of issue, or you might use this method just because I want to make sure the receive payment form is used as a receive payment to lower the accounts receivable and therefore the deposit form can then be used to increase the checking account, making it easier to sort transactions for increases to the checking account because there won't be multiple form types in there. You can sort the documentation in accounting software, for example, simply by form, deposit form, possibly including transfers too, but we'll talk about that later. So then the accounts receivable is gonna be going down and let's put some zeros across the board again zeros across the board only things happening in the uh in the asset side of things nothing's happening to the revenue even though we got paid why because we're not on a cash basis here we're on an accrual basis and we already recorded the revenue and so i'm going to say that the 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 sub ledger is going down for customer b b's paid us good old b our customers are our good customers we don't have those dead beats they keep not paying us taking our stuff they take our stuff and then don't give nothing back, man. Bunch of leeches. Anyway, I did my part of the bargain and then they just, that's not how, that's not who we do business with, man. Our customers actually pay us. We're appreciated over here. We're appreciated. Okay. <laughs> I got a little, little upset there. I don't know what happened. I'm going to put some underlines over here. Let's, let's copy this down to the prior balance to, 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 to here. And then we'll copy this one down to here. 
So now the last time, and then we'll copy this one down. And so we had an, an increase. Let's put some underlines under here. I should have done that before. And now we're going to have the new balance. So new balance is going to go. Isn't that a product of some kind? The new balance, like a shoe or something? I don't know. New balance. That's not what I mean here. We're going to sum it up again, little darling. Summing it up. Okay, little darling. Is that okay with you, little darling? Sum it up. Little darling. All right, we're pasting it with just uh, the formulae only. Just the formulae. All right. Okay. So now we have, now we can use a deposit. So now on 415, we're going to use an actual deposit. Uh, you know, and, and it might, it might be, well, we'll just call it a deposit. So again, this is something you don't really see in a book problem, but in practice, we see it all the time because now we have to transfer out of the undeposited funds, putting it now into the checking account. In this case, we only had one deposit. Therefore, it's not really like grouping anything together. Therefore, we could have put the deposit directly into the checking account, but still it might have a purpose to do it this way because now again, I can use a deposit form to make the deposit into the checking account, having all increases in the checking account using the same form, making it easier to sort by transaction type. All right, so the deposit's gonna be the 1,004. And let me copy this down before I do this. You're getting ahead of yourself. Don't get ahead of yourself. That's what I always say. But I hate waiting for myself because I'm so slow. You're so lame. I have to wait for you. Yeah, you can't get ahead of yourself. Why can't myself go faster? If I, okay, let's sum this up now. We're gonna sum it up. Here we go, equals the sum of these two. And then we're gonna, no, wait a sec. No, that's not right. That's not where I'm at. Now I'm gonna say the checking account's going up. Checking account goes up and then undeposited funds goes down. That's where I'm at. That's the two sides of the transaction. So once again, only impacts on the asset side of things. Let's put zeros across the board again. Zeros across the board. It's like a soccer game. You've got zeros across the board, except for those two points, those two points up top. All right, let's go up top and let's put, now notice that you can also freeze the panes. So I'm going to do this now. You can, I'm going to put my cursor right here. It has to be right here. I've scrolled all the way up. I'm going to put my cursor here so I can see these headers even as I scroll down. So, and, and so I'm going to do that by going to the view tab and then freeze the pane, freeze the pane. That's what I do when I've got gout in my foot. I freeze the pane. Okay. That's not the same thing. What are you talking about? Okay. I'm just saying. I had, I had a gout attack, okay? No, notice the other way you can do it is you could go over here and you could split, or I mean, you could freeze the panes here. So now you've frozen it this way and this way. So that might actually be better because then you can see the transactions, but it also kind of messes things up. It confuses people a little bit. The other thing you could do uh, is you could uh, split the panes right here so that now I can, I have a whole different like pane over here and I could scroll on this one separately. So that's useful too. But again, it went, for a screencast, uh, that confuses people. So <laughs> that'll work for you when you figure it out. But for me, I'm gonna do a simple, just freeze the top rows and freeze the panes. Freeze the pane because it hurts. It hurts, it needs to be frozen, man. F just freeze the foot right off if you could. That would be helpful. All right, let's sum this thing up now. Equals the sum of these two. Oh, there's stupid beeping in the background. I have to do it all over again. I can't, that's gonna mess up my whole recording. Let's paste this, just the formulas, just the formulas. Pasting just the formulas. Okay, and then we'll copy it down to make sure that we are remaining in balance. So nothing happened because again, one asset went up, the other asset uh, went down. 
So nothing happened from an accounting equation standpoint. Okay, so now let's do the other types of investments. So, so notice that when you're setting up your accounting system in say accounting software or something, you might say, hey, look, can't I automate the deposit somehow and, and make an automatic deposit, maybe figuring all deposits are from customers or something like that. You kind of can do that in some systems depending on the industry you're in, but need to be very careful that if you are doing that, if you get a deposit from something other than a customer, you do not want to record it as revenue. Otherwise, if you're in an income tax system like in the United States, you'll be paying taxes on it. And that's not what you want to do. So, for example, you might get money from the owner. So the owner investment in business. So the owner's putting money in, let's say $10,000 from uh, the owner goes into the business. Now in a sole proprietorship, it would just go directly from the owner. If it was a partnership, it would be whatever partner, you'd have to allocate it to the proper capital account. If it was a corporation, how does an owner invest in a corporation when the owners are the shareholders? That's the issuance of the shares directly from the corporation, not shares that you buy on the secondary market, but shares issued directly from the corporation is money going into the company from the owner, the shareholder, right? The initial offering, the, the issuance from the company. Okay, so that's gonna be the idea. Now, if you see that, how can I differentiate that from money that's coming from a customer? Well, the money coming from a customer you might have different dollar amounts. Usually when you got the money coming from the owner, it's going to be something kind of even like a $10,000, right? Versus if you're selling stuff, especially if there's sales tax, you're going to get some funny number. Oftentimes an owner investment might be larger than a normal singular sale, for example, or because you might be putting money in when you start the business or possibly when you're expanding the business. But whatever it is, you want to make sure that whatever system you have, you can separate the deposit from say an owner which shouldn't happen all the time, more of a rare situation than from the customers, which hopefully do happen all the time. The other side, where does the other side go? Cash goes up. The other side does not go in the income statement. We want to avoid recording it in here in sales. It would still increase equity, but it shouldn't hit the income statement because it wasn't earnings. It should go directly into the owner's equity or issuance of capital if it was a corporation so that we still see that it's money that is owed back to the owner, but it wasn't earned. It's not going to be part of retained earnings or owner's equity, the account that we roll over the income statement to. So there it is. 10,000 goes up on the equity side. Let's put our zeros across the board. Boom. Now this is something that again, we would possibly just use a deposit form from a data input standpoint to record, even though in practice, it would most likely be an electronic transfer, possibly using bank feeds to record it, but the bank feeds will still use within the system, a deposit type form as the data input, if you were to drill down on the electronic bank feed typically, or so that's gonna be the idea. Let's sum it up. So there, we're gonna copy this across. I'm kind of trying to go a little bit faster because we're running long on time, running long on time. And I don't want to run long because I get out of breath if I'm running too long and then I then I pass out and then someone the tiger eats me or something. So I have to go faster. So let's copy this down and then we'll copy this down and then we'll copy this down. So now assets went up equity went up, but it wasn't the income statement directly to equity went up. All right, let's do one more that we might get on, let's say 620. Maybe like when I'm investing in the company, the investment could come from money that we got out of retained earnings. If there was money in the company that had accumulated from the sales that have happened in the past. But if it's a new company or you're trying to expand a lot, then you're going to need other resources of money. Where's it going to come from? Well, the owner, shareholders or owners or partners or a loan. That's the other way you might get the money to expand buying, you know, new new space to put space in now. Now that the economy the economy seems a little bit more on track these days, they might get some regulatory stability 
where we at here on in America. So maybe people are going to be feeling a little safer to take out a loan and not have the regulatory burden shooting their legs out from under them. And so we could take out a loan and say, I'm feeling like this might be the time, man. This might be the time to expand. So we're going to say this is going to be 10. Let's say the cash is going up again. But once again, we want to make sure that it's not go the other side is not going to income. It needs to be going to a loan. Now, when we record a loan, it's going to be a liability because we owe it back to the bank. When we record a liability, there's going to be issuance issues with payments of the liability because I'm probably going to be paying it back in installments. Those installments having both a cash, uh, a, 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 a principal and interest component to them. So the question becomes with a loan, should I record it as a short term or long term uh, loan? And uh, and so that becomes an issue that we might dive into a little bit more in uh, future presentations because it also becomes a reporting issue because the loans could have a short term and long term component to it, which you want to be aware of for reporting purposes. But you don't really want to have two accounts that you're always dealing with every time you make a loan payment. It also causes problems with the bank feeds. So and there's multiple ways that we can think about dealing with it. But for right now, the main point is you want to make sure that you record it as a loan <laughs> and not as revenue. It shouldn't be on the income statement. So this is going to be an increase to the loan. Boom. Shaka laka. Let's put the zeros across the board and wrap this thing up like a present that you're putting under the tree. Uh, under the tree. So let's go like this. Not Don't wrap it up like I would wrap it. It would be ugly then. But like if someone knew, we're going to wrap it up nicely. Like if someone knew, like someone would do that knew how to wrap it up here. Let's wrap this thing. Let's sum it up. So we'll sum this side up. Copy this across. Copy it across. Paste it. Formulas only. Paste it. Formulas only. Paste it. Formulas only. And then we'll copy down. The last bit here, copy down, copy that, 10-4, 10-4, roger out. Liabilities impacted this time. What? K paso, my liabilities are missing. I added a new account over here and it's not, so I'm gonna have to fix this. See what's happening? It didn't pick that one up, so I'm gonna drag this over here. You need to pick that one up, dude. Dude, what are you doing? That's okay, I fixed it. All right, your worksheet is broken, man. I can fix it. So now we have an increase. You're broken. I've, so now we have an increase in assets and an increase in liabilities. And here's our ending balance as of this point in time. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so there's that one. 